Uh, good afternoon. I call this meeting of the property tax division to order pursuant to house rule 10.01. Um, our first order of business is roll call um, to figure out who's present. The clerk, Mr. Peterson will take the roll. Chair Joachim. Present. Vice Chair Gomez. Present. Representative Hertos. Present. Representative Anderson. Anderson present. Representative Becker Finn. Present. Representative Fisher. Fisher present. Representative Green. Present. Representative Hassan. Present. Representative Her. Present. Representative Marquardt. Present. Representative Mortensen. Present. Representative Pulowski. Pulowski present. Representative Torkelson. Present. That concludes the roll and a quorum is present, Madam Chair. Thank you, Mr. Peterson. Um, before we move on, uh, Representative Hertos, did you have a question? Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. And uh, I just wanted to uh, let the chair know that uh, we have a caucus, Republican caucus is protected time from 4.30 to 6 p.m. And so uh, I guess I'm to advise you that uh, we need to end the committee at 4.30. Um, thank you for that. Uh, Chair Joachim. Thank you, Madam Chair. We will be doing the whole 90 minutes today. We have a really full agenda. So um, we were not, uh, we had a caucus tonight too. Everything got pushed back because of the floor. So we'll be going for our full 90 minutes. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, so just before we move on, I wanted to note that the committee documents for today have all been sent to members via email and for the public, they're available on the committee page on the House website. Uh, the first item on the agenda is approval of the minutes from March 4th, 2021. Representative Herr, have you had a chance to review the minutes? I have, Madam Chair, and so moved. Um, uh, Representative Herr moves the minutes for uh, March 4th. Does anyone have any questions about the minutes? Seeing none, we'll move on to the, to the vote. Um, we're gonna do a voice vote, so please un unmute yourselves for a moment and uh, so that we can take the vote. Um, all those in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? The motion is approved and the minutes for March 4th, 2021 are adopted. Okay, so the first bill on our agenda today is House File 1311 from Chair Joachim. Chair Joachim, would you like to move your bill? Yes, Madam Chair, I'd like to move House File 1311 um, before the division for a possible inclusion in a division report. Representative Joachim moves um, House File 1311 be laid over. Um, did you also have an amendment, Chair Joachim? Yes, Madam Chair, I do. Um, First, I would just want to say good afternoon, Madam Chair and members. Thank you for hearing House File 1311. I know we are in a crush for time today, so we will try to ask testifiers to be really brief on all the bills and maybe we can get done um, before um, our 90 minute slot. So I do have an amendment. It's labeled DE2, it's in your packets. It simply tightens up the definition of energy improvement projects and provides some direction to local government units. Um, it was just easier to read and be drafted as a DE. Uh, so that's what's before you. Thank you, Chair Joachim. Is there any discussion on the DE2? Um, seeing none, if we could unmute for a second so we can take a voice vote. All those in favor, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? The motion prevails and the amendment is adopted. We have the bill before us, Chair Joachim, to your bill. Thank you. Uh, the bill before you would add energy improvements to the list currently in statute of what a municipality can consider a special assessment. Currently, the owner of a property can ask the city to assess the construction costs for installing a variety of projects, including a fire protection system, a pedestrian skyway system, or an on-site water containment improvements. This would add energy improvements to that list. And the amendment we added further defines what those improvements can be. And by making this accessible, it enables the owner to pay for the project over a set period of time on their property tax assessment, instead of having to pay the full cost up front. The city of St. Louis Park has been working on encouraging small business owners and individual homeowners to accomplish energy savings projects in their, in their current buildings and homes. So this is on existing property. Items like improving the building envelope with ins insulation, 
high efficiency heating and cooling mechanisms, mechanical systems, and installing solar panels. This simple change in statute would allow the owner of the property to invest in these energy efficiency improvements to their properties and petition the city to assess the cost to the property. To be clear, the owner of an existing building would have to make this request in order for this tool to be utilized and the city would have to want to use this tool as well. I would like to thank the city of St. Louis Park and staff for bringing forward this creative idea to encourage energy efficiency and enable folks to do their part to combat climate change. I have with me today, Brian Hoffman, who's the director of building and energy from the city of St. Louis Park to further explain the proposed legislation, as well as Soren Maddox, the city attorney uh, for St. Louis Park here on standby to answer any questions if needed. Thank you, Chair Joachim. Uh, Mr. Hoffman, welcome to the committee. Please introduce yourself for the record and proceed with your testimony. Well, certainly good afternoon, uh, Madam Chair and committee members. My name is Brian Hoffman. I serve as the uh, Building and Energy Department Director for the City of St. Louis Park. And we're very appreciative of Representative Joachim for introducing this to the committee today and look forward to your positive uh, consideration. We have a very deeply ingrained uh, partnership with our community members, especially our small business and trying to basically promote success and investment within the community. I'm going to share a little bit about the fire sprinkler program because what we're envisioning is that this would allow us to expand it for over 20 years now we've been utilizing uh, section 15 of this statute 429 and letting our commercial property owners know that if they want to improve their property with a fire protection system, lowers their insurance costs, protects the property, uh, and it helps the city out, that this is one of those partnerships that has just been supported. So a property owner would say, we'd like to take advantage of it. They get multiple quotes, work with our city staff, in fact, in our fire marshal in this instance, to make sure that what they were proposing to do would be you know, an appropriate system uh, and uh, price valued. Uh, they do the work, we would inspect it, approve it, and then it would get assessed to the property. In about 20 years, this has been very successful. There's been no issues or concerns with it. We see the same model being used, especially for our small businesses uh, as we embark upon our climate action plan. Uh, to help them take their businesses and make them more energy efficient. It saves them money and it also helps reduce greenhouse gas emissions. Furthermore, most of our uh, businesses, especially our small businesses, they're in buildings that are 1940s, 50s, 60s vintage, and they really need to be invested in to keep them viable, which is an important part of community livability. So we see this as being a very straightforward amendment that would uh, allow a city to uh, go ahead and administer and finance these through a revolving fund, uh, basically to help our property owners uh, make these valuable energy improvements. Thank you. Thank you so much, Mr. Hoffman. Um, members, are there any questions for the testifier or for represent or for Chair Joachim on House File 1311? Um, seeing none, uh, Representative Joachim, did you have any closing comments? Um, thank you, Madam Chair and members for your time. And I'm open for questions as we lay this over. As I said, this is a really um, simple addition to statute that doesn't cost the state any money, but would create and spur valuable energy efficiency investments in properties across our state. Uh, the city would have to be willing to do this. The homeowner would have to be petition. And I think it's a win-win for everyone. So. I would ask for your support and let me know if you have any questions as we move forward. Thank you so much, Chair Joachim. Chair Joachim renews her motion that House File 1311 as amended be laid over for possible inclusion in the division report. And the bill is laid over. And I'm turning the fake gavel over to you, Madam Chair. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, and members, next up bill on the agenda is House File 1507 from Representative Hamilton. Can I get a motion to move House File 1507 before the division? I'll move, Madam Chair. Thank you, Representative Herr. Representative Herr moves House File 1507 before the division. We have the bill before us. Representative Hamilton, to your bill. Thank you, Madam Chair and members of the committee. Thank you, Representative Herr, for moving uh, my bill as well. And, and I understand you have a very, very packed agenda. 1507 is a uh, five-year extension for the city of Wyndham and their TIF district. 
Uh, Madam Chair, I'd like to turn the testimony over to uh, Mr. Steve Nasby, if I could, and remind my testifiers uh, to keep their comments to two minutes or under. They would, please. Thank you, Representative Hamilton. Uh, Mr. Nasby, welcome to the committee. Please introduce yourself for the record and proceed. Uh, thank you, Chair Yakim and uh, members. Uh, my name is Steve Nasby. I'm the city administrator, uh, City of Wyndham. And as uh, Representative Hamilton alluded to, we're asking for a extension on a TIF district. Uh, we have TIF District 1-22 in our community. Uh, it is a redevelopment district. Uh, it is a 34 acre parcel um, that's been industrial use uh, right on the lake shore of the lake in town. Um, we've got a unique opportunity to redevelop that site, do some uh, shoreland restoration, some lake protection, and also develop some additional housing. Uh, we had to get the district started in 2018 as we had a private uh, party um, looking to build a 45 unit apartment complex that was badly needed in our community. Uh, that got built and opened in September of 19. Uh, we have some other developers that were lined up to do projects in 20, in 2020. And then uh, kind of COVID impacted that. Uh, we had them uh, back off some of their initial proposals just to kind of wait and see how that played out. And now in, at the end of 2020 and now to, in the beginning of 2021, um, we're getting some indications from the developers that uh, building supply costs are also um, pretty high due to uh, kinks in the supply chain during COVID. So they're looking for another year or so before they're willing to make a commitment. Um, because we had to start the uh, TIF district window back in 18, so we could get that first apartment building built, we are kind of under some time uh, frame um, squeezes, shall we say, on this district. And we would respectfully ask for an extension of TIF District 1-22, the five-year rule to uh, extend to 10 so that we could enter into agreements with these developers. And then also that's a five-year extension on the back end so that we could continue to capture the same amount of uh, TIF revenue that we would have initially. I'll stand for any questions from yourself or the members. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Nasby. Members, are there any questions? I know member, many of you are familiar with TIF and we'll be talking about it as we go on in the agenda. Uh, Madam Chair. Yes, Representative Hamilton. Uh, Madam Chair, um, I was contacted by Mr. Nord with the state auditor that said we may need a technical fix. I don't know if Mr. Nord is on this call. Yes, thank you for reminding me. Um, Mr. Nord, Will you state your name for the record and proceed? Sure, uh, Madam Chair, this is Jason Nord. I'm the TIF director at the OSA. And um, I just noticed that the, the bill contained an extension to the five-year benchmark of the five-year rule, but the following subdivision in statute talks about beginning in the sixth year um, for some additional restrictions. And um, it, it, seems it, would, it could be appropriate to change that to the 11th year if the five-year rule is being extended to essentially a 10 year rule. So um, it would be a nice cleanup to avoid confusion. Thank you, Mr. Nord. And uh, we'll be working with Representative Hamilton on that. I, I had forgotten about that six year rule too. So as we lay this bill over, we'll continue to work on the language as needed. Um, Representative Hamilton, did you have, or right, first members, any other questions after uh, Mr. Nord's comments? Seeing none, Representative Hamilton, final word. Well, once again, Madam Chair and members of the committee, thank you for hearing this bill and we'd simply ask for your support. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you. With that, Representative Herr uh, renews her motion that House File 1507 um, be laid over for possible inclusion in the division report. With that, members, we're going to move on to another one of Representative Hamilton's bill, House File 1508. Can I get a motion to move House File 1508 before the division? Madam Chair, I'll uh, move House File 1508 uh, for possible inclusion into a division report. Thank you. Uh, Representative Hurtas moves House File 1508 before the division. You have the bill before us. Representative Hamilton, to your bill. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair, uh, members of the committee. Thank you, Representative Hurtas, for, for moving our bill. Uh, House File 1508, uh, very similar, but it's for the city of Mountain Lake. And 
And Madam Chair, this is the town that I actually call home. I live here and uh, with me, I have uh, Mr. Rob Anderson, who's been working extremely hard. And this has been a fun story too with Mountain Lake. The four lane highway opened in 2018. And since then, uh, Mr. Anderson has been able to secure a brand new Casey's. Uh, we have an a and restaurant. Everybody come on down. It's fantastic. And uh, Madam Speaker, or excuse me, Madam Chair, I'd like to turn it over to uh, Mr. Anderson to speak to the bill and remind him to keep his testimony under two minutes. Thank you, uh, Representative Hand Han Hamilton. Re Mr. Anderson, welcome to the committee. Please introduce yourself for the record and proceed with your testimony. Uh, thank you. Good afternoon. My name is Rob Anderson. As uh, Representative Hamilton said, I'm the Community Development Director for the City of Mount Lake. Uh, just like to also give a little quick shout out to uh, Representative Hamilton. We're pretty proud of him representing uh, our community at, at the state legislature as well. Um, the City of Mount Lake is requesting today that the Minnesota House extend the five-year rule to 10 years for uh, our redevelopment TIF district number 1-8. TIF district number 1-8 is located in our downtown next to the city park and is currently vacant. The intent of establishing this TIF, TIF district was to acquire four severely dilapidated downtown properties, demolish the buildings and prepare the site for redevelopment. As a, much as we've tried over the past five years to get a project funded and under construction, to date we have not been successful. The city has invested over $225,000 in the district to date. We are now working with a private developer that has expressed interest in developing a multi-purpose building with retail space on the main floor and housing units on one or more upper, upper levels. If we hope to get this project going, we'll need TIF to make it work. This is why we are respectfully requesting an additional five-year extension. And currently, again, due to COVID, um, our TIF district will expire April 2021. So we are running up against a, a quick deadline here. So your action and support is very much appreciated. I'd uh, be glad to answer any questions. Thank you, Mr. Anderson. Members, are there any questions from Mr. Anderson or Representative Hamilton? Um, may I have one quick question, Mr. Nord? Does this one also bump up against the six-year rule? Mr. Nord, uh, proceed. Yes, yes. Uh, uh, the same issue uh, with the extension of the five-year rule. The five-year uh, was changed to 10, and so changing the sixth to the 11th year would be a nice uh, clarifying change. Thank you, Mr. Nord. So we'll note that um, as well as we move forward. Members, any questions? Seeing none, Representative Hamilton, final word. Um, well, thank you, Madam Chair and members of the committee. Um, once again, simply ask for your support and thank you for hearing the bill. Thank you. Thank you, Representative Hamilton. Uh, Representative Hurtas renews his motion that House File 1508 be laid over for possible inclusion in the division report and the bill's laid over. Um, the next bill on the agenda is House File 1736 from Representative Fisher. Representative Fisher, would you like to move your bill before the division? Yes, Chair Yoakima, I'd like to move House File 1736 to be laid over possible inclusion. Thank you, uh, Representative Fisher. And I believe that you have an A3 amendment as well. Uh, yes, Chair Yoakima, I do. I would like to uh, have the uh, A3 amendment to get the shape, the bill into the shape that I would like it in, please. Thank you, Representative Fisher. Um, members, I know you all have the A3 amendment in front of you in, the, in your electronic packets. Are there any questions on the A3 amendment. Seeing none, members, this will be a voice vote, so please unmute your microphones. All those in favor of the A3 amendment, please say aye. 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 All those opposed? No? Um, thank you. The A3 amendment is adopted. Um, Representative Fisher, to your bill. Thank you, Chair Yoakim and committee for the opportunity to present House File 1736. Uh, this is a bill that provides some flexibility for tax increment financing. I've been working with city organizations on language to provide some additional flexibility. A common request that cities receive is how they can help our small business with tools to assist with housing construction, preservations. 
These issues have taken on more importance during the current pandemic. The bill provides additional flexibility for cities to also do more with existing tools. Section one of the bill allows for temporary use of unobligated increment from a TIF district to a city's general fund after adoption, adoption of a spending plan. Section two provides flexibility for use of tax increment for housing similar to some of the city specific housing TIF bills we've heard. It also increases the percentage of expenditures that could be used outside of a district for affordable housing. And sections three and four extend the five-year rule to a 10-year rule so districts that have been impacted by delays in redevelopment may remain viable. Overall, the intent is to make it flex easier for cities to have their flexibility to make their TIF projects work. Um, this is somewhat modeled on a bill that was uh, that came out on TIF districts after the Great Recession. I do have several testifiers here with me, and I also pledge that this is still a uh, work in project. Uh, pro this is a work in process, and I am committed to continue working on the bill to make it even better. And with that, I'll turn it over to my testifiers. Thank you, Representative Fisher. I believe that um, we are going to keep it really brief. So uh, thank you to Gary Carlson for being willing to uh, um, turn it over to Ms. Nelman. So Ms. Nelman, welcome to the committee and please introduce yourself for the record and proceed. Wonderful. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair and members uh, for the opportunity to testify today in support of House File 1736. And I will be very brief and I, I recognize the importance of that. So um, I am uh, Patricia Nauman. I'm the executive director of Metro Cities and Metro Cities and the League of Minnesota Cities. Gary Carlson and I have been working very closely with our cities and, and uh, to just to craft a bill to on language for a bill that does provide some cities with some needed flexibility in the use of tax increment financing. Uh, TIF, or otherwise known as TIF. TIF is a very important local tool to spur redevelopment. And it's one of the few tools in the local toolbox uh, for these purposes. Um, but of course, it's a complicated tool to use. And sometimes, as you know, cities come forth with individual bills seeking things like extensions and other uh, needs for modification in the use of the tool to accommodate you know, either delays or certain uh, local, local project considerations. So I appreciate the time to testify today. One of the most, uh, it, as Representative Fisher pointed out, uh, a very common request for cities is um, uh, for the extensions. The uh, right now also in this bill is on section one, it is a provision that would allow flexibility for cities during the COVID-19 pandemic in the use of excess increment uh, for general municipal purposes on a temporary basis. This language was modeled after a 2010 law uh, that gave cities some flexibility during the Great Recession at that time. And so we are trying to sort of stay within the spirit of the precedent, but again, to uh, allow for some flexibility during this uh, challenging time for many cities um, with, uh, uh, with their finances. The section two does provide additional flexibility for in, uh, using tax increment for housing and locally identified housing needs. And we are hopeful that it would jumpstart the creation of more local housing trust funds, which provide to be very helpful as cities do address uh, local housing needs. And this is certainly something that has been a key issue and certainly the center of debate for the state and local governments for the last several years. That section also does increase the percentage of expenditures that can be used outside of a district for affordable housing and it adds qualifying owner occupied housing as an eligible use. And again, the intention there is to allow cities some flexibility with the use of TIF for these purposes. The bill also does extend the five year rule to 10 years um, for cities that across the state that have been impacted by delays in redevelopment due to COVID and other circumstances um, so that they could remain viable for redevelopment. And again, this I, I think is very consistent with certainly um, the many bills that cities ask for for extensions just to accommodate local projects that sometimes just cannot be done within the time frame of the TIF uh, district. So Madam Chair and members, I will uh, be happy to stand for any questions and thank you for your time this afternoon. Thank you, um, Ms. Nauman. I believe that we also have uh, Mr. Nord again signed up. Uh, Mr. Nord. Sure, uh, thank you, Madam Chair. Um, and again, for the record, uh, my name is Jason Nord. I'm the TIF Division Director at the Office of the State Auditor. And very briefly, I just wanted to offer uh, some neutral and technical comments given our past experience with uh, the similar provision used back during the recession. So uh, I'd acknowledge that Section 1 does provide local governments with uh, some financial flexibility, but the committee might also want to understand that uh, the return of unneeded increments can occur 
uh, without this provision. And in under current law, what would happen is returned increment would be redistributed to the county, the city, and the school district. So that would give the county and the city some financial flexibility uh, where the school district share is generally just offset from state aids. Um, and TIF authorities using either the spending plan under section uh, uh, one or using the current law authority, uh, they might end up uh, capturing increment for a little bit longer than they might otherwise um, by not using the increment to, to decertify sooner. But on a more technical level, uh, first, I appreciate the inclusion of paragraph D, the paragraph D language, um, uh, but I do have one question that may need clarification. If a city hasn't returned um, excess increment that they had been required to return, it's not clear to me if that is considered ineligible under paragraph D or whether that would be usable on obligated increment. So that would be a nice clarification. Um, second, I would just note that in our previous experience with spending plans, they were often very broad. Uh, so I don't know if there's any um, expectation for what our office should do if we receive plans that don't provide significant details. Uh, and then also um, I note under paragraph F, there's uh, a requirement to identify um, a plan for how to spend money that wasn't able to be spent by 2022. Uh, and it wasn't clear to me whether uh, those subsequent plans should also be sent to our office. Uh, and then uh, lastly, under section two, I note that it says that the transfers to the housing trust funds are not subject to the TIF Act reporting requirements. Uh, it would be important to our office to actually have those transfers, transfer amounts be reported. Um, and perhaps this was just meant to apply to the subsequent uses of those transfers. Uh, but if we're not aware that a transfer occurred, it would just appear to us that uh, TIF funds disappeared. So um, that concludes my observations and I'd be happy to answer any questions. Thank you, Mr. Nord. That was very helpful. And uh, Representative Fisher has mentioned that he still wants to continue to work on this. Representative Fisher, any comments about that? Uh, thank you, Chair Yol Kim. I appreciate the uh, information from uh, Mr. Nord. I did receive it late yesterday, and it is something that I've been working with the local cities on uh, organizations. And it is something that we want to make sure that we get these points all addressed to make sure that things are clear for the uh, state auditor's office and transparent as much as possible. So thank you. We appreciate the advice. And as we get the language redrafted, we'll look forward to, to the continued input to make sure we've got it right. Yes, and, uh, thank you, Representative Fisher. And thank you, Mr. Nord. I am also carrying a bill language around that affordable housing trust fund transfers. And I will take your comments to note as well as we move forward. Um, members, are there any questions for Representative Fisher? Um, Mr. Nord, Ms. Nauman. Seeing none, um, get to the right spot here. The, there we go. Um, Representative Fisher renews his motion that House File 1736 is amended be laid over for possible inclusion in the division report. Um, so the bill is laid over. The next bill on the agenda we have is House File 1887 from Representative Torkelson. Representative Torkelson, would you like to move your bill? Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. I do have an amendment to the bill to get in the shape I'd like. Thank you, uh, Representative Torkelson. Um, I, why don't we uh, move your House File 1587 before the committee? Um, would you make that motion first? Uh, move that House, House File 1580, 1578, or 1587 be laid over for possible inclusion in the committee report. Thank you. And then uh, the bills moved before the committee. And now uh, to the A2 amendment, Representative Torkelson, could, I believe you could either briefly explain the amendment or Representative Hurtas could as well. Oh, thank you. I'd be happy to explain the amendment. The amendment will uh, just extend the original bill to go statewide instead of just for greater Minnesota and include the uh, six year provisions that we've been talking about off and on today. Thank you, Representative Torkelson. Members, any questions on the amendment that is labeled A2? Seeing none, this is gonna be a voice vote, so people unmute. Oh, uh, Representative Hurtas, did I hear? Uh, Representative yeah. Hurtas, you go ahead. Yeah, thank you. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. And I just wanted to share quickly 
uh, some information about the A1 amendment and the suggestion and idea to uh, uh, modify this uh, to include the entire state in terms of a policy decision on extending the five-year rule to the 10-year rule. And in doing so, I asked health research to do some little bit of exploring uh, on a limited time basis that they had. Uh, I did get some of the replies and I just wanted to share just quickly a little bit of data about our uh, general TIF districts. And so uh, with regard to TIF districts uh, statewide, uh, during 2019, there were 1,648 active TIF districts. There were 1,043 of them in greater Minnesota and the remainder in the metro. That breaks down to approximately two-thirds in greater Minnesota and one-third in the metro area. On the other hand, with regard to revenue generated by type, uh, when we compare those same data statewide versus greater Minnesota, uh, what we're seeing is about 200 and $43 million of revenue that's generated statewide. Uh, here, uh, Greater Minnesota generates the smaller portion, about 36 million, and the metro area, about 206 million. Also, uh, with regard to uh, uh, the law that we're proposing, it's interesting to note, or is important to note, that back in 2009, we did a blanket extension of the five-year rule for districts certified between 2003 and 2009 to accommodate for the development slowdown during the recession during those years. As you know, Madam Chair and Chair Marquardt, uh, I reached out to both of you to discuss this idea. There seems to be general support to do it. And I will just add that uh, oftentimes with uh, redevelopment districts and housing, economic development, all of the uses of TIF, there's a good deal of uh, money and a lot more zeros involved today. Uh, fortunately, interest rates are lower, but nonetheless, uh, risk taking is, is a uh, big deal. And in terms to, in, in the prospect of inducing developers to go ahead and come forward, always time is, is always a, an issue because as a developer, you just never know what the absorption rate will be. Uh, by that members who are not familiar with development, the absorption rate is the rate in which the land actually gets developed and you get tenants and or uses of fully occupying the property. So uh, th I think this is a good step to move forward and uh, I'll uh, keep my comments brief, but I would look forward to uh, working with Mr. Nord uh, on really kind of uh, unifying a, a, a better policy for the use of TIF as we move forward. Thank you, Representative Hurtas, and I really want to thank you for your work on this and reaching out and um, and improving on all of our TIF extension bills by having this discussion. Um, Representative Torkelson, I believe that you are oh, first members uh, to the A2 amendment that's in front of us. So members, this will be a voice vote. Um, any further questions? Uh, I didn't see any further questions on the amendment. So all those in favor of the A2 amendment, please say aye. 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 All those opposed, aye. no. The A2 amendment has passed and Representative Torkelson to your bill. Representative Torkelson, you're still on mute. First time that's ever happened. Uh, as uh, thank you, Madam Chair and members, as uh, you, as 1587 as amended, uh, will extend the TIF uh, for all TIF districts potentially uh, to 10 years uh, and in some cases 11 years under the six year rule. I do have a testifier, at least one, maybe two, uh, that I believe are on the line. And uh, I would call on Dan Dorman to, uh, if he's online, to uh, speak to the bill briefly. Um, Mr. Dorman, um, please introduce, welcome to the committee. Please introduce yourself for the record and proceed. Thank you, Madam Chair. My name is Dan Dorman. Uh, I'm representing the Coalition of Greater Minnesota Cities uh, and the Greater Minnesota Partnership uh, on this issue. And we've heard about the, the issue that a lot of the cities in Greater Minnesota have brought forward is uh, development sometimes takes time, uh, particularly uh, I'm thinking about both in Red Wing and Austin, the cities have identified larger parcels that they would like to um, rehabilitate and eventually do uh, workforce housing projects and there's significant tracts of land and they're going to acquire 
uh, the property as it becomes available. What the issue is, is if you acquire the piece of land, tear the building down, that five-year clock starts to run and uh, they'd be better off in that case leaving the blight stand. Problem with that then is, is blight. People don't like to look at it, impacts neighboring properties. And so the requests that we originally put in, and we certainly have no objection to it being statewide, weren't sure if it was a, the same issue in the, in the metropolitan area. Uh, happy to see the amendment re regardless. But our, our issue was that, you know, the, the, you, you tear the building down, the five-year clock starts, um, you may not be able to acquire all the property that's going to be needed for this particular development within that five-year period of time. So our request was to uh, delay that clock so that it would start not necessarily when that first building uh, was removed, which is what the, the bill does. And we're very appreciative of uh, Representative Torkelson carrying the bill and, and the amendment offered and you for hearing it. I'd be happy to stand for any questions if you have have them. I think it's a fairly straightforward piece of legislation, but uh, um, happy to, again, answer any questions you may you may have, Madam Chair, or members of the committee. Thank you, Mr. Dorman. I think we'll go to the next testifier I have signed up, and then we'll go to questions. I have a Marshall Hallett. Could you please uh, state your name for the record and proceed? Uh, Madam Chair, if I can interrupt, I'm not sure that Marshall was able to uh, I think he's testifying on another bill, and I, I don't know that he'll be able to join us with the change in timing. I apologize oh, for that. Oh, no, Mr. Dorman, no need to apologize. It may, just makes things a little bit quicker. Um, members, anything, any questions for Mr. Dorman or Representative Torkelson? Seeing none, Representative Torkelson, final word. Well, thank you, Madam Chair. I think the bill is fairly straightforward. Uh, thank you for hearing the bill. Thank you, members, for uh, your support. And uh, thanks to the testifiers and Representative Pertos for his support. Um, I'm just surprised I haven't heard from the department, but maybe we got it right this time. Thank with you, that, Representative. Uh, with that, Madam Chair, I renew my motion that uh, House File 1578 be laid over for possible inclusion. Thank you so much, Representative Torkelson. Representative Torkelson renews his motion that House Bill 1587, as amended, be laid over for possible inclusion in the division report. Um, the bill is laid over. And thank you, members. And we're going to move on to the next item on the agenda, which is House File 1666 from Representative Howard. Can I get a motion to move House File 1666 before the division? I'll make that motion, Madam Chair. Representative Fisher moves that House File 1666 be placed before the division with uh, possible inclusion in the division report. Re uh, Representative Howard, I believe you have an A1 amendment. Madam Chair, that is correct. Thank you. Uh, well, uh, Representative Fisher, will you be willing to move the A1 amendment before us? Yes, Madam Chair, I'd like to move the A1 amendment, please. Thank you, Representative Fisher. Um, Representative Howard, welcome to the Property Tax Committee. Uh, please briefly describe your A1 amendment. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, the A1 amendment is just a one-line technical amendment uh, to get the bill in the shape that I'd like it. It's similar to an amendment I think we've seen in some other uh, housing tip bills that have been before the committee. Thank you, Representative Howard. Members, any questions on the amendment that is labeled? And I got to get to my right page here. Um, sorry, I should have said that before. The A1 amendment. That makes it easy. And members, any questions on the A1 amendment? Seeing none, this will be a voice vote. Please unmute yourself. All those in favor of the A1 amendment, please say aye. 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 All those opposed, no. The A1 amendment is adopted. Um, Representative Howard, to your bill. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, House file uh, 1666 is a bill that uh, comes to us from my community in Richfield. Uh, Richfield is, is like many other communities across the state that are taking an active role in the housing space, in particular in work to address our affordable housing crisis. Uh, this bill uh, would uh, add some flexibility to our housing TIF district in Richfield uh, to be able to address the specific community needs we're seeing in Richfield. 
Um, and I think I'd like to have my testifiers speak to more of those specifics. Uh, but uh, I'm just grateful to be before the committee and uh, welcome any questions. Thank you, Representative Howard. Um, Mayor Gonzalez, welcome to the committee. Please introduce yourself for the record and proceed with your testimony. Good afternoon, everyone. I am Mayor Maria Regan Gonzalez. Oh. There we go, of Richfield. Um, and I just want to thank the chair and the committee members for hearing um, our request today. So, as many of you know, um, affordable housing is a crisis right now across our state. And ensuring that we have housing affordability and, and stability is foundational across all of our communities. But in Richfield, just to give you a snapshot, 72% um, of our students are students of color and many of our students in our school districts are renters. And so ensuring that we have housing stability and affordability is crucial in ensuring that our students and our, our families um, can thrive like they need. And um, Richfield traditionally has been a pretty affordable community for quite a while, but given the housing pressures we are facing and the market rates that are drastically increasing, it's really being threatened right now. That affordability and stability in our city is being threatened. And that's not only the case in Richfield, but that is across the region and across the state. So we are seeing a lot of emerging needs um, because of this pressure on our affordable housing. And we wanna make sure that we have the tools necessary to address these needs. So that includes making sure that we're able to support residents who are cost burden with their housing payments, including those folks that are earning minimum, minimum wages, folks that need housing that's affordable and accessible, including for our seniors, for our residents with disabilities as well, making sure that our families and our students have the housing stability that they need. Um, and then we have the physical conditions of our buildings. So uh, the majority of our apartment buildings and single family homes in Richfield were built in the 1950s and in the 1960s, and they are in desperate need of repair. Um, and so what we're asking for is additional flexibility because the current amount of state and federal housing resources is really has not been enough to meet the needs that we have in our community to keep our housing affordable and maintain that stability. So I will pass it on to our housing manager, Julie Urban, but our request is to have more flexibility in our tools to, to meet these housing needs. Thank you, Mayor Gonzalez. I'm Ms. Urban, can you state your name for the record and proceed? Thank you, Madam Chair, Representatives. I'm Julie Urban, and I'm the Housing and Redevelopment Manager for the City of Richfield. And I just talked more specifically about the proposed legislation um, that's before you today, again, is to provide Richfield with a, a flexible tool and funding source for affordable housing efforts. It would allow us to transfer pooled tax increment into our affordable housing trust fund. So with our trust fund, we can construct and preserve housing that's affordable for very low-income renters, up to 50% AMI, and also for low-income homeowners, up to 80% of the AMI. So for many years, Richfield has required any new development that receives tax increment to either create affordable housing or contribute 15% of the increment to pooling. So we currently pool 15% of the tax increment generated by three different redevelopment TIF districts. And so we are asking to be able to transfer the existing and future pooled increment from those districts to our trust fund and, and then be able to use those funds consistent with the trust fund ordinance and policies that the city has adopted. The proposed legislation would also allow us to access that additional 10% affordable housing contribution that's currently allowed in TIF law. We'd like to be able to use it for both affordable home ownership as well as affordable rental opportunities. So Richville has long been a leader in affordable housing programs that address just the continuum of housing needs. And we wanna be able to expand on these efforts and to meet the growing need uh, of our residents and, and the region. And, but we need resources to do that. So our pooled increment is one such existing local resource. You know, it's not a new tax, it's instead funding that's already being collected and that we just want to be able to utilize to its greatest potential. So passing this legislation, allowing us to do our affordable housing work through our trust fund would give us the flexibility necessary to respond to the needs of our community and, and help those needs uh, in the broader region. So we thank you for the opportunity to present to you today and we are available for question. And, and we also have our HRA attorney, Julie Eddington, available if there are any technical um, TIF legislation questions. Thank you so much. Thank you, Ms. Urban. Um, members, are there any questions for Ms. Urban or Mayor Gonzalez? or Representative Howard. Oh. 
Seeing none, uh, Representative Howard, final word. Thank you, Madam Chair. I appreciate the time before the committee and really enjoy uh, getting to be with Mayor Reagan Gonzalez and Julie Urban. It feels like getting the old band back together a little bit. Uh, this is a great bill uh, to help our community meet the housing needs of our community. And uh, I just really appreciate the opportunity to be before the committee today. Thank you, Representative Howard. Um, with that, Representative Fisher renews his motion that House File 1666 is amended, be laid over for possible inclusion in the division report. And the bill is laid over. Um, the next bill on the agenda is House File 1157, also from Representative Howard. Can I get a motion to move House File 1157 before the division? I'll make that motion, no. Madam Chair. Uh, House File 1157. House, uh, Representative Fisher, uh, makes the motion that House File 1157 be before the division. So now we have the bill before us. Um, uh, Representative Howard, to your bill. Thank you, Madam Chair. I really appreciate uh, the time uh, in committee to bring this bill, this very important bill related to housing and, and property taxes uh, before us today. This bill uh, is, a, from my perspective and the perspective of housing providers, and advocates across the state, a key element to our work this session and beyond to address our affordable housing crisis. Um, I think uh, for our members that are on our, our housing committee or preventing homelessness committee, I think everyone agrees we need to be proactive in addressing our affordable housing crisis. And that's the spirit that this bill comes before us today. Uh, to, to give you some background, this bill deals with a 4D property tax rates and, and a little bit of background um, about the problem that this bill is attempting to solve uh, and its impact in our work in affordable housing. Uh, for taxation purposes, affordable housing is assessed at the same level, same value as market rate, even though it cannot generate the same value unless rents are uh, raised and not affordable. And so to correct this, the legislature created a 4D property tax status uh, to create a lower rate and to incent the creation and preservation of affordable rental housing. Uh, you know, a few years ago, like probably most people that, you know, 4D is that uh, a robot in a Star Wars film, R2D2, I had no idea what, uh, what we were talking about uh, until I saw the real tangible and positive impact that this had in my community. Uh, in 2017, uh, Seasons Park, a 400 unit, uh, uh, housing, uh, uh, multi-use housing facility in Richfield, uh, which uh, was a naturally occurring affordable housing, which means fairly old, pretty run down, um, but it was a huge source of affordable housing in our district. It also uh, had a lot of two and three bedroom apartments. So 300 children uh, lived at Seasons Park. It was on the brink of being sold, repurposed, uh, and everyone in that facility would have been displaced. Uh, as we've and we've seen this kind of mass displacement and naturally occurring affordable housing all across the region and state. It's especially harmful to our BIPOC communities. It's hurt our kids. Um, but instead, we had a different outcome. Aon, a nonprofit housing provider, was able to emerge really at the last minute uh, and uh, secure and purchase Seasons Park and also commit to making the improvements to make this a more quality, affordable place for people to live in our community. The 4D property tax status was a key element to make the financing of this uh, facility work and Aon operates Seasons Park to this day. Uh, since then, that was a few years ago, the utility of the 4D property tax status has been greatly minimized as property tax values have went through the, the roof. In the last seven years, uh, property tax uh, values on Class D properties have increased by more than 70%, essentially wiping out the benefit of the original legislation. And so what this bill would do was simplify and reduce the 40 property tax rate, bringing it in line with the intended goal to create and preserve affordable housing throughout our state. Uh, the benefits of such a move would be many. Uh, first and foremost, uh, this would allow housing providers to keep rents down and grow their portfolio uh, for affordable housing. And this is especially relevant in our work to preserve NOAA housing like at Seasons Park in Richfield. We know that every day, especially in this pandemic, more and more uh, multi-tenant uh, facilities are at risk. And this is a critical part in being uh, in that fight to maintain uh, housing affordability. Uh, lastly, I wanna to respond to one potential criticism, 
criticism of this bill, which is that potentially it could cause a property tax shift onto homeowners. Uh, this is the third year uh, I've been working on this bill uh, and the issue has been studied extensively. Uh, we've done property tax analysis uh, and that's available by community. Um, and there is a modest shift, no doubt. Uh, but just of note, just 43 cities have more than 2% of their overall tax capacity in 40 affordable housing. And of those 43 cities, uh, 29 would see less than a $20 uh, shift on an average home. Uh, and uh, I just wanna commit to legislators, if you have a question about how this proposal would impact your city, I would love to follow up offline and provide that data and work together with you to understand the impact. Uh, and so I acknowledge that there, there could be a, a slight shift, but I think the balance of the value created, especially when we're talking about our huge gaps in terms of racial equity, make this a no brainer. Uh, and I really encourage your support of this bill. I've got testifiers today that represent a huge coalition of nonprofit uh, housing advocates, the Homes for All Coalition and more uh, that believe this is a key tool for us to address our affordable housing crisis. Uh, now is not the time to wring our hands, it's the time for action. And I uh, would encourage your support of this bill. Thank you, Representative Howard. Um, looking at the time and wanting to be respectful of the 4.30, um, we will be recessing at 4.30 and coming back at six o'clock. Um, I would like to get through the testifiers for this bill and maybe member questions if possible. Otherwise, I'm sorry, we're gonna have to have folks come back. Um, so with that, um, Representative Howard, who is your first testifier? Madam Chair, I believe Alan Arthur, CEO of Aon. Thank you. Mr. Arthur, will you um, introduce yourself for the record and proceed? Chair, you came, Keem, and, and uh, representatives, it's uh, great to be here. My name is Alan Arthur, and I'm the president and CEO of Aon. Aon is a nonprofit, a developer, owner, and manager of 5,560 affordable apartment homes in Minnesota. We're one of 17 nonprofits and for profit affordable housing producers who develop and operate most of the affordable housing properties in Minnesota. We have a coalition to support this bill. As a previous testifiers have stated, we face an affordable housing crisis in core cities, in suburbs, and in greater Minnesota cities as well. One issue we face is this, uh, this uh, affordable, is the, how affordable housing rental properties are taxed. As Representative Howard said, almost a decade, a decade ago, the legislature created the class 4D tax classification, classification as a tool for the creation and retention of affordable units through a two-tiered tax rate. As unfortunately, Representative Howard stated, the evaluation of affordable properties is driven by market rate housing valuations. That's right. Assessors value our affordable two-bedroom unit that has an $1,100 a month rent. They value it based on the $2,000 a month rents across the street in the market housing. So that this has severely reduced or wiped out entirely the tax benefit of the original state policy. As a result, really over the last few years, essentially and effectively, the taxes have been shifting from other properties onto the shoulders of these affordable apartment home properties in the last few years. So it makes it extremely difficult for operators, operators like uh, Aon, both nonprofits and for-profits to keep rents low and reinvest in the properties. House file 1157 would simplify and reduce the classification rate for all 4D properties and make the state tax code work for rather than against the state's policy goal to encourage the development and retention of affordable housing. Thank you for your consideration. Thank you, Mr. Arthur. Um, next up, we have Mr. Williams. Please introduce yourself for the record and proceed with your testimony. Thank you, Madam Chair, and thank you, Representative Howard. My name is Paul Williams. I'm the President and CEO of Project for Pride and Living, uh, PPL. PPL is a nonprofit organization uh, whose mission is to build hope, assets, and self-reliance um, through affordable housing and career readiness services. Um, we own and manage about 1,600 units of affordable housing across the Twin Cities, including Minneapolis, St. Paul, and, and several Western suburbs. Um, Close to 3,500 folks live with us every night. Um, uh, we also help over 5,000 uh, adults and young people build skills and, and get jobs with living wages. Um, I wanna speak in support of House File 1157 today. 
Um, there are many policy tools which need to be used to address the affordable housing crisis uh, in Minnesota. Lowering the tax rate on, on class 4D units, as Alan was saying, is among the most cost effective of those tools. Um, lowering that tax rate on these properties can also have a quick beneficial impact providing the certainty of tax relief for affordable housing operators and developers for the, the, the pay 2022 um, year. So I just wanna sh quickly share with you the, the tax impact which these skyrocketing property valuations have had on our projects uh, across the, uh, the, the Twin Cities. So, so for us at PPL alone, property valuations on our portfolio of affordable housing buildings have increased 33% since 2017, just in the last three years. The property taxes on those same buildings have increased by 37% from 2017 to 2020. That amounts to an additional $383,000 in taxes that we've paid over that same, uh, that same time period. Um, per unit taxes have increased from $976 to $1,337, an additional $361 uh, per unit. So at PPL alone, the, the 4D proposal here would save our properties almost a million dollars per year or $832 per unit. Right now, I have to go out and raise those dollars from philanthropic sources. Um, that is getting increasingly difficult to do. Representative Howard's bill would allow us to take those savings and help us offset the increased COVID-19 uh, costs, which are very real. It would help us keep rent increases, as Alan noted, to a minimum, and it would increase our reinvestments in crucial capital and operating support for our existing properties. All of that has real impact, obviously, on real folks across our properties, as well as across the state. For new development, which is so desperately needed, it will allow us and our peers to leverage more private debt and reduce the dependence on public investment required when building new affordable housing projects. Right now, the decision to build new affordable housing, both workforce housing and especially for the very lowest income housing in our communities is increasingly difficult. It just doesn't pencil out. If we can't make this work as a nonprofit, we simply won't be able to build more affordable housing. And the only folks who can build that, especially lowest income housing, really are nonprofits who can even begin to make it pencil out. So this really is crucial. So obviously, as, as Alan noted, this bill does shift some costs uh, off of low income renters who have been especially hard hit in this pandemic and this economic downturn. Those folks are disproportionately female heads of households uh, uh, as we heard, and, and come from communities of color. So in short, Madam Chair, while this bill was already much needed before COVID, we can almost look at this as pandemic relief, actually, a, a measure that would do much good for many at a very small cost. So thank you and, and happy to stand for any questions. Thank you, Mr. Williams. Um, I Before we recess until six tonight, I see a hand up, uh, Representative Gomez. Question for these testifiers. Oh, uh, thank you, Madam Chair. I guess I, I wanted to, um, I, I'm really thankful to Mr. Williams and Mr. Arthur for being here. Um, I know that, uh, you know, Mr. Williams, I, we haven't really had much of a chance to meet. You're, you're a son of Rondo, but I'm a daughter of the South Side and the community that I love and where I live wouldn't be what it is without you. And so thank you for all your work there. I really, really appreciate it. Um, I guess I'm, I'm wondering, you know, I know that, that Aon and that PPL are going to invest any tax benefits that they get back into their tenants, back into their buildings, keeping rents affordable for people. I guess what I'm wondering about is, you know, there are a lot of affordable housing purveyors who are for profits um, who expect a return on their investment. And I'm wondering how it is that we can ensure that, um, you know, that, that benefits that are going to the owners of properties whose primary motive is profit, how we're ensuring that, the, that this benefit gets passed on to the people who we know need it, right? Who are our low income renters. So I guess, I don't know if the author or anybody else has a comment about that. Um, who would like to briefly answer that so then we can go to recess. Um, Representative Howard. Madam Chair and Representative Gomez, that's a really great question. You know, the goal of this bill isn't to sort of improve a balance sheet. You know, it, it is the goal is to preserve 
and improve and expand uh, the amount of affordable housing in our communities. And so um, uh, if there's ways, I, I think uh, there has been some discussion about uh, the notion of guardrail, so to speak, or, or something that could, uh, you know, uh, ensure the sort of accountability and transparency uh, related to this. And I think that's important. I'm really open to that um, and uh, view that as uh, a really helpful suggestion as we kind of take this bill through the process. Great, uh, Representative Gomez, quick follow-up. Um, no, that's that's good. I appreciate it. I do think that um, you know if we're going to move forward with adding this to our division report, that that maybe we should just talk more about what that actually looks like in, in the legislation. But thank you, yes. Madam Chair. Thank you, Representative Gomez and members. Um, we're going to continue this discussion at six o'clock. I hope. The testifiers can stick around um, for this bill and then we'll move to Representative Hur's bill. So with that, members, we are in recess until 6 p.m.